tonight, a surge of violence in Winnipeg so bad, even police are alarmed. Our community is really, really, it's bad. The drastic measures to help them cope. An inferno rages in eastern Australia, and fire season is just beginning. There's so many ways it's wrong. Health Canada bans a product promising to detox vaginas. I want you to meet my cousin, Russell Buffalino. How are you? And the Hollywood blockbuster you will not easily find in theaters. The battle between the big screen and Netflix. This is The National. In Winnipeg tonight, the city is struggling to deal with a surge in violence. The number of homicides is near record highs. Some of the victims, children, investigators are stretched thin. And the problem is so bad, the Prime Minister and Premier discussed it today. Now, police are taking extraordinary measures. Cameron McIntosh explains. An outpouring of grief and support at a crowded wake this evening for Hunter Strait Smith. The three-year-old died after being stabbed in his sleep, a victim family friends say of an alleged domestic dispute. It's devastating that the, this is the outcome that we got. You know, we were all praying for a better outcome. Hunter's murder underscores a spike in homicides in Winnipeg, 40 so far this year, double the usual, including an unprecedented 11 homicides in a 30-day span. Our community is reeling, really, and, and our organization is reeling here. Police Chief Danny Smythe says officers are being reorganized to deal with an investigative backlog, which will include temporarily shutting all three district stations as 74 officers are redeployed. These changes, I think, are necessary so that we can address the health and the wellness of our frontline officers. There's no one clear reason for the increase in homicides. Police say gangs, the meth crisis, and domestic violence are all factors. What we're acknowledging here is we, we need help. Earlier this week, Winnipeg's mayor called on senior levels of government to help address root causes of crime, including poverty and addiction. Today, the Prime Minister met with Manitoba's Premier, who says there's a willingness to cooperate. I'd like to see the federal government partner with us to uh, make our streets safer. Hunter, meanwhile, dreamed of being a police officer. At his wake, police designated him an honorary constable. Contois is hoping the political talk leads to something tangible. Don't let this little boy die in vain, you know, for and not, not have an impact in this whole city. As for those staffing changes, police say they're temporary until they either get caught up or the spike in violence ends. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. And Saskatoon police are investigating after the body of an infant was found in a dumpster. Right now, time is really of the essence in locating the mother of this infant. We believe that she is in uh, likely a great deal of physical and emotional distress. Police believe the baby was born recently, but haven't said much more than that. They asked the public to report if anyone knows of a woman who is recently pregnant, but now without a baby. An autopsy is scheduled for Tuesday. Okay, let's take you to Washington now, where more testimony is trickling out of Donald Trump's impeachment inquiry. National Security Council official Alexander Vindman and Trump's top Russia advisor, Fiona Hill, both saw a White House demanding Ukrainian investigations into the Bidens in return for aid and access. Arthi Pohl explains where this testimony is going and how close it's getting to Donald Trump himself. Today, the U.S. president declared he is not at all worried. I'm not concerned about anything. The testimony has all been fine. I mean, for the most part, I never even heard of these people. I have no idea who they are. Trump's memory gap extends to the man who he appointed U.S. ambassador to the EU, Gordon Sunland. I hardly know the gentleman. Trump's claim today followed the release this week of Sunland's testimony transcript, which he revised to describe a quid pro quo with Ukraine. At the center of the impeachment inquiry, the allegation Trump withheld military aid to Ukraine until an investigation was opened into presidential candidate Joe Biden, his son, and the energy company Burisma. New transcripts released today adding fuel to the fire. Uh, this is quite damning for the president. Quid pro quo is Latin for a favor for a favor. Uh, he openly <laughs> asks uh, the president of, of uh, Ukraine for a favor.
Testimony from the White House's former chief Russia advisor, Fiona Hill, and from Alexander Vindman, who still holds his post at the National Security Council, point to EU Ambassador Sondland, saying he conveyed the message to Ukraine officials about what was needed for the release of the aid and for an Oval Office meeting. In the transcript, Sondland speaks of an arrangement made with the White House chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney. Mulvaney today ignored a subpoena to testify behind closed doors. We wanted to hear whether he made the decision to withhold the aid or did the president order him to withhold the aid. And that missing peace is now a key message for Republicans. It's actually getting easier to defend the president from a standpoint there is no linkage. And Trump maintains the whole process is a sham. They shouldn't be having public hearings. This is a hoax. Despite Trump's wishes, the spectacle of public impeachment hearings with testimony in living color is sure to grip D.C. in the coming days. Arthi Pohl, CBC News, Washington. Now, Democrats have lined up public testimony from three officials next week, and they're clearly aiming to start Wednesday with a bang. First up is Bill Taylor, ambassador to Ukraine. Do you think this was a quid pro quo? Behind closed doors, he testified that the Trump administration was withholding everything from a presidential meeting to military aid until Ukraine announced investigations into Trump's political targets. The White House painted him as a radical bureaucrat, but Taylor will not be easy to dismiss or discredit. He's a decorated Vietnam vet with decades of service in government, including prominent diplomatic postings under presidents of both parties. To Australia now, where fire is sweeping through parts of the country, decimating homes, land, and wildlife. It's particularly bad in the east. More than 100 fires are burning across coastal New South Wales and Queensland alone. New ones cropping up daily, their size and speed a real challenge for emergency workers. They simply can't keep up. And there is another worry, the hot, dry wind feeding those flames. As Kim Brunhuber tells us, smaller fires are growing merging and transforming into monsters. This fire, said one Australian mayor, is a horrifying beast. And this is what it's like inside the beast, an inferno raining flames. Officials believe this fire in Eastern Australia was sparked by a lightning strike. Now thousands of residents in the country's most populous state are waking up to an ominous orange, a sky screaming danger. My car's packed, ready to go. I'll make a judgment call. I might be out of here in 10 minutes. I might be out of here in a half, half an hour. I'm not sure. There are now almost 150 fires burning across the country. Unfortunately, uh, we are in uncharted territory this afternoon. Uh, we've never seen this many fires concurrently at emergency warning alert level. Uncharted territory because Australia's hottest summer on record has created a drought-stricken landscape primed to burn. Now, hot, dry, windy conditions are making these fires more intense and more dangerous, and it's not just threatening humans. The fire may have wiped out about half the koalas living on a coastal reserve. It's not going to be good news, and there's likely to be hundreds of dead koalas. Authorities here have managed to rescue 10 of the animals, including a burnt koala they named Paul. Many others, they say, won't make it. It's tough. They, are, they look terrible, the poor little things. They're black, obviously. Um, they're, some of them are in a lot of pain. More worrisome still, the heat and relentless winds are expected to continue until next week, fueling fears that some of the large fires may actually combine. And the long-term outlook isn't much better. November is springtime in Australia. And with the forecasts predicting an extremely hot, dry summer, experts say this is just the beginning. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Job action by public transit workers in Vancouver has reduced service for a week. But today, problems escalated with late buses and cancelled boat service. And the union warns it's only going to get worse. So what do commuters think? Greg Rasmussen found out. For some transit users, this is what they saw trying to get home tonight, the impact of escalating job action. Mechanics are working fewer hours, leading to a shortage of working buses. As part of the job action, drivers aren't wearing their uniforms. It all leaves transit users fearing a total shutdown. Oh, that would be bad. <laughs> that would be really bad. It would have a huge impact because I have to commute every day to work. I have to take public transit every day. I don't drive. It's expensive, man. 
to have a car here. So transit is easier for people to go back and forth. These vessels are part of the transit system, but crews are refusing overtime, meaning longer waits as dozens of sailings have been cancelled. So far, the biggest disruptions have been here at the sea bus, which shuttles hundreds of people at a time from downtown to North Vancouver. The union is pushing for higher wages and more breaks for drivers. Our members are very determined, um, so this will escalate and eventually will end in a full work stoppage. Talks have broken down, but the transit company says it's ready to present a new offer to the union. I remain optimistic that they will come back, but as of yet, they have not uh, indicated such. If buses do grind to a halt, this industrial relations expert thinks the province will quickly intervene. I don't think any government is going to tolerate a transit strike in the metro vancouver area for any length of time at all for now it's wait and see with transit users left wondering what's coming or not coming down the road greg rasmussen cbc news vancouver well as if the pain of losing his wife wasn't enough an edmonton man was also recently handed a big bill it was for his wife's long-term care accommodations for the 30 days after she had died and as Rafi Bujikanyan reports, his story shines a light on a clause that's actually in many nursing home contracts. Yeah, this is the rental agreement. When Scotty and Darlene Hamilton moved into a private senior's home run by Touchmark, Darlene had mild dementia. Then things got more complicated. Difficulty operating the stove, difficulty operating a microwave, uh, issues of that nature. Darlene moved to a memory care unit in the home. In October, Scotty's wife of 59 years passed away. Touchmark told him he was on the hook for her apartment for a month after her death. I did ask the executive, uh, ma uh, executive director here if he would be prepared to waive that, uh, that requirement, and he said he would not. Did you say why? It's in the contract. The agreement Hamilton signed says a tenancy shall terminate automatically 30 days after the resident's death. Um, the policy isn't yes, unheard of. It is fairly common across the country. Still, this senior's advocate understands the surprise. Many families aren't aware of these clauses that are contained in the contracts, so when the time comes that they need to confront it, it can certainly be a shock. After CBC called Touchmark, it informed Hamilton he'd get the money refunded. The home then told us Hamilton was charged due to a communications breakdown, that it would be revising its processes to ensure this doesn't happen again. And as, uh, of course, the population ages, um, more people move into long-term care facilities. This health law expert says governments should look at tougher regulations on senior care companies. Now would certainly be an opportunity to, to decide um, what sorts of regulatory changes would adequately protect these residents. Hamilton accepts Touchmark's explanation, but says it should never have happened in the first place. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. Now to a CBC News investigation into a key aspect of this country's criminal justice system. Police officers play a critical role, but certain actions by just a few of them can really undermine public confidence. Chris Glover examines the evidence. One in. I see. Suspects are supposed to face the camera during a police interrogation, but in 2012, robbery suspect Gil Kim was shown from the back, unlike his co-accused and against police protocol. And I know for a fact that you were there that day. While Kim ultimately admitted to the robbery, he says police beat him to try to get him to confess to more. The officers denied it, and a subsequent professional standards review by another service found no assault took place. But the judge sided with Kim, deciding he was seated to hide injuries. And the officer's explanation that Kim chose where to sit bordered on ludicrous. In fact, the judge was so incensed, even though Kim clearly took part in the robbery here, she stayed the charges and let him go to make a point. CBC News uncovered more than 50 cases in Canada over the past five years, where a judge determined an officer gave misleading testimony and the case against the accused fell apart. 
Winnipeg defense lawyer James Lauer used to be with police internal affairs in Toronto. He investigated a notorious corruption case involving drug squad officers who were later convicted of falsifying notes and lying in court. After investigating them, Lowry quit policing to become a lawyer. He says when police give false testimony, often the criminal walks. You're doing a horrible disservice to the community because here is an offense where a person is factually guilty, but at the end of the day, they're acquitted. We wanted to ask you a few questions about previous cases that you've worked on. CBC News spent months reaching out to lawyers, scouring legal records, and filing freedom of information requests to compile our list of cases. You're looking at the tip of the iceberg with that. For roughly two decades, this Alberta lawyer has made his own similar list. He believes mandatory public databases of police found to have given false testimony would make officers think twice. In, in order to have a deterrent effect, it, it has to, again, it has to hit the public view. Not only does the public not know how often it happens, it's also unclear how often police are disciplined for it. Turns out that information is just as difficult to get. Most services said they couldn't tell us and considered it an internal matter, underscoring yet again how little the public is told. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. And we'll be back in two minutes with more news. From vaccines to climate change, how do you convince a skeptic? Our second look panel goes in depth. But first, the myths and dangers around vaginal detox pearls. That's next. Health Canada has stopped the sale of a so-called vaginal detox product following a CBC Marketplace investigation. The tiny herb-filled balls are being marketed as a way to cleanse women. But as Cass Rusi explains, experts say they don't work and they could be harmful. The latest fad promises that toxins will be flushed out of a woman's most personal body part. It's called Goddess Vaginal Detox Pearls. And on the company's website, testimonials abound about how these tiny pearls, once inserted into a plastic applicator, then into vaginas, can fix everything from menstrual cramps to infertility. I know she was conceived from those pearls to improved mental health. I mean, it's a great detox to do spiritually, emotionally. The pseudoscience has been around for a very long time. I mean, snake oil has, has been around since people have been selling products, I'm sure. Canadian gynecologist Jen Gunter has spent much of her career debunking online myths about female health. She says this product is risky. Nothing in there should go in your vagina at all, none of it. One of the ingredients listed is a Chinese medicine called Borneol. In 2002, Health Canada issued a warning about a product containing a synthetic version of the ingredient. While the pearls were never authorized for sale in Canada, people were able to order them online. That changed following the marketplace investigation. Health Canada contacted Goddess Detox and asked that Canada be removed as a shipping destination. Gunter is especially worried about claims the product can help women get rid of bad boyfriends or more disturbing, past sexual trauma. I think that's very predatory. The idea that, that, first of all, that there's any kind of remnant in your vagina from sexual trauma is simply not true. When it comes to vaginal health, Gunter says the best remedy is just to leave it alone. But if a woman is experiencing discomfort and pain, drop the pearls, she says, and go see a doctor instead. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, among the other stories we're following tonight, a senior RCMP official accused of preparing to leak sensitive information has been ordered back to jail. Cameron Ortiz was released on bail last month, but a judge revoked that today after the Crown requested a review. The Crown says he'll be taken back into custody immediately while he awaits trial. Ortiz is the former head of the RCMP's intelligence unit, and he's charged with preparing to share sensitive information with a foreign entity or terrorist organization. After days of backlash and multiple protests, the Quebec government has made a dramatic about-face, putting on hold controversial changes to its student immigration program. The program gives foreign students and some temporary workers a fast track towards permanent residency. But 
Earlier this month, the province cut about 300 fields of study from the eligibility list. That left a lot of people hoping to settle in Quebec without a clear path forward. Tonight, sources in the Premier's office say the changes are being dropped for now. And U.S. health officials say they've made a breakthrough in their vaping investigation. They say vitamin E acetate, which is used as a thickener in vaping fluid, was found in the lungs of 29 patients across 10 states. And they believe that could be what's making people sick. Since March, there have been more than 2,000 cases of lung damage linked to vaping in the United States. There have also been a small handful of cases reported here in Canada. Okay, short break coming up. But when we return, the battle between Netflix and the big screen. Why you won't find some new releases in theaters. And later, a rapper's shocking admission about checking his daughter's virginity. Why that shouldn't happen in Canada. Famed director Martin Scorsese earned the ire of some film fans this week after an op-ed declaring... Marvel movies aren't cinema. He argues there's no revelation, mystery, or genuine emotional danger. Nothing is at risk. Enter The Irishman, Scorsese's latest epic, perfectly in keeping with his definition of cinema and designed for the big screen. There's just one catch. You might have a hard time finding it in theaters. And as Eli Glasner explains, that's because of an ongoing war between theaters and Netflix. I heard you paint houses. This is the film fans of Martin Scorsese have been waiting for, a star-studded tale about the mob and morality. I've seen every film Martin Scorsese has ever made, and I've never been as moved as I was when I watched The Irishman. Hello, Canada! Cameron Bailey is the co-head of TIFF. Its cinema is the only place you can watch The Irishman in Canada right now. For him, it's a film best seen on the big screen. The way he uses the camera, his camera movement, his editing, all of those things are so prodigious that you really get the full impact when you're in a movie theater. Big business and the but don't bother lining up at your local multiplex. The epic crime story is only available in Canada in limited runs at independent theaters for the next few weeks. This is all we're after. A far cry from when Scorsese's Oscar-winning film, The Departed, opened in more than 3,000 locations across North America. But with a running time of three and a half hours and expensive de-aging visual effects, the only studio that would front the reported $200 million budget was Netflix. When it came time to release the film, the major theater chains had a problem. Most films are released with an exclusive theatrical window of about 90 days. Netflix reportedly wanted 30 discussions ended without a deal. I think Netflix kind of wants the benefit of, of the, the halo of a theatrical release, uh, both for the prestige that it gives for the filmmakers, for the opportunity for, you know, Academy Award consideration. But from our view, if they're going to be in the business of theatrical, they need to really be in the business of theatrical. While theater organizations complain about the lost opportunity and revenue, the CEO of Netflix has made his priorities clear. We're not in the business of theaters. We're in the business of pleasing our members on a global basis. And so when we produce uh, a great film like uh, Two Popes or Marriage Story or Irishman, we want to get it out to our members. I want people to see great movies. Cameron Bailey says audiences don't want windows. They want choice. They just want access to these movies. And people will make their own decisions about what they think is worth going out of your house and paying for a babysitter and parking and all that kind of stuff to, to see. And what you're just going to turn on your TV at home and watch. And so while Martin Scorsese decries how cinema is changing, the majority will watch his masterpiece not in the cinemas, but on the couch or maybe even their phones. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, up next, how to convince skeptics when the facts don't seem to be enough. Our Friday panel takes a second look. Welcome back. How do you convince a skeptic of something when even cold, hard facts aren't enough? That's a question that became particularly important in recent weeks. And in at least three cases, the stakes are very high. Example number one, vaccine hesitancy. As a parent, does that concern you? Um, I mean, I don't, not really. Uh, like, I, I understand why people choose not to vaccinate their children. I just think life is full of risks, and I don't think it's a big issue, personally. 
According to a CBC News analysis, at least 10% of students at a dozen alternative schools in Toronto were not vaccinated on account of their parents' personal beliefs. This despite the fact that there is no credible scientific dispute to what we know about the safety of vaccines or their role in protecting us and others from harm. Example number two, climate change. 11,000 scientists from around the world signed a paper naming the world's most pressing challenge a climate emergency. It calls for an immense increase of scale in tackling the problem and warns of untold suffering. And yet, there is still a large gap between what the science says we must do and what we seem willing to do. Example number three, texting and driving. Oh, look at Buddy Boy on the right. He's got his cell phone right oh, up to him. You can see his lane, look at him swaying. Fines are increased, they're adding more penalties, suspensions, and people are still on their phones. Now, underscoring all three of these examples is that society collectively knows better. We know better. So why can convincing people to act like it feel like pushing a boulder uphill? And here's the more important question, perhaps. How do you convince someone of something that is so nakedly obvious when they just refuse to believe? Now, every Friday, we try to take a topic in the news and we break it down in a way that's, that's hopefully interesting, insightful, and empowering. We call it our second look. And as always, we have help, a cross-section of expertise spanning three distinct disciplines, starting with Dr. Danielle Martin, Chief Medical Executive at Women's College Hospital. We have Diane Sachs, Climate Consultant, President of Sachs Facts and former Environmental Commissioner of Ontario. And we have Robin Robertson, Executive Director of the Traffic Injury Research Foundation, joining us from Ottawa tonight. And we're going to start uh, with that topic. Consider this. According to the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police, one in four car crashes in this province involve a phone. And depending on the jurisdiction you're in, more people die from distracted driving than from impaired driving. We know it's dangerous, that we shouldn't do it. It's illegal. And yet, Robin, why is it that so many people just don't listen to reason? Uh, I think, honestly, Andrew, it's because people don't appreciate the risks. We've become very comfortable in our cars. We spend a lot of time driving, and we tend to underestimate the complexity of the driving task. So I think we've become accustomed to using our phones in our cars, and for that reason, if we've not yet experienced a collision, keyword being yet, uh, we don't see the harm. But it's a funny kind of denial, though, right? Because most people would say, well, well, other people shouldn't text and drive, except they seem to have this, this, I guess, inflated sense of their own ability to do it. Right. So people tend to be very observant in what's happening with other drivers and tend not to recognize those behaviors in themselves. Um, and a number of national surveys have shown that drivers tend not to self-identify. And if they don't self-identify as being a distracted driver, they really don't see the need to change their behavior. So, so how do you crack that? I mean, how, how do you dispel that, that, that impression that, that distracted driving isn't as dangerous as it is? Well, Andrew, I think we need to uh, give people some experience to learn to self-identify. For example, we have, you know, tried to have a phone conversation while we're watching TV, and you've got to do one or the other. And I think we don't uh, appreciate the complexity of um, the challenge when we're trying to do those secondary tasks when driving. So we need opportunities for people to experience that, but in a safe environment. But, but so, how, so how do you drill that message home, right? I mean, I mean, do you can you can you shame someone into thinking that that hey, this is just not something you ought to do because there's so much more at stake than just yourself? I mean, how, how do you do it? And so speaking up, um, being aware of the facts, and when we see other people doing it, um, not being distracting ourselves, uh, but certainly. Um, Speaking up to say that we think it's unacceptable and we think it's unsafe, that's very powerful to change people's behavior. Okay, let's talk about vaccinations now. Um, so in Ontario, if you're not up to date on your vaccines, you're not allowed to go to school unless you get an exemption on medical, religious, or personal grounds. But recently, Toronto Public Health issued a warning that the number of students getting non-medical exemptions is steadily going up. It says in 2016, 0.8% of students had non-medical exemptions. This year, 1.7%. Now, it's still low, but it's not an increase unique to Toronto. This is something that's province-wide. Danielle, what is your, your best explanation for why, despite the, the, the kind of overwhelming scientific consensus, people are still 
doubtful. Well, and it's not just in Toronto, Ontario or Canada. In fact, the World Health Organization has named vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 greatest threats to health in the world this year in 2019. So it's an international problem. Um, and the reasons, of course, are complex, but a lot of them relate to a combination of either mistrust or skepticism about the medical system and the safety of vaccines, complacency. So it's just, you know, it's too much of a hassle. You can't get in. You think you'll do it next week. Um, or a lack of confidence. And so there's a, there, it, depending on the individual and the family, the interplay between those factors may be very different. And one thing that we know doesn't work is yelling at people more loudly that they should get vaccinated. You, you can't shame someone. You, you can't and you shouldn't because actually, you know, there are a lot of examples in history where the medical establishment actually has gotten things quite wrong. So I have a lot of sympathy for skepticism and asking questions. But when you're in a, in a room one-on-one -on -one with someone who's worried about the potential impact of a vaccine on their kid's health, that's the opening for a conversation. I'm just curious, what, what does that one-on-one -on -one conversation sound like? I mean. Well, so it's it, uh, the, the research on this says that you want to present vaccination as the default, the routine. You know, we're going to be vaccinating your child today because there are a number of illnesses that we you don't you don't want your kid to get tetanus, you don't want your kid to get measles. So we're we're going to be proceeding with these vaccines, and then you know, do you have any questions? As opposed to, what do you think about having, you know, having your kid get their shots? So. And what do you say to someone who pushes back? So that then it becomes a, a, a listening exercise. You know, explain to me. What are your concerns? Some of them are really legitimate. People are worried about pain. So we know, for example, that there are things that we can do to reduce pain in vaccination. You can walk a parent through. These are the, the ways that we can make this as painless as possible for your child. And then also helping them to understand the potential consequences for their child's health. We also know that sharing data is important, but sharing stories is also very important. So, and, you know, t talking about the the impact, for example, of measles that uh, uh, on a on a child's health potentially um, is a really good way to to bring home the personal protection, not just the community protection. Okay, this next topic, uh, we've saved the biggest for last. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? So that was an impassioned plea, Greta Thunberg, of course, to take climate change seriously. But at this stage, you know, we've also heard it all before. We've heard kids sounding the alarm, grown-ups, scientists, politicians. I mean, how many, Diane, how many UN you know, international panels on climate change have we heard where they've, they've raised the alarm. How do you go about convincing the, the, the vast majority of people out there that this is indeed an urgent problem that requires immediate action? And, and whether that's individual action or whether that's something, you know, like exerting political pressure, right, on, on leaders or exerting financial pressure on businesses. Your wallet speaks volumes, right? I mean, people don't seem to be acting like this is an emergency. My experience going, uh, traveling around Canada talking about climate is not exactly what you're describing. I find that lots of people recognize that we're in trouble. People can see it if they're farmers, the growing season's changed, the precipitation has changed. If you're a hunter, the animals are disappearing. If you're a fisherman, the, the, the fish are declining. Um, lots of people are already seeing changes. Most people feel helpless, most people feel alone, and most people don't see a path forward that they know how to walk, um, where they can still look after their families. Mm. So I think that focusing, places like Copenhagen have done really well. They've gone from economic disaster, very, very high on unemployment, to a wonderful city that people like to live in. And people cycle to work not because they want to be sustainable, because it's the fastest, cheapest, easiest, most convenient thing to do. So if we make the infrastructure that makes, as just as Daniel says, make it easy, make it the default, um, Lots of people will do it. If we make it difficult because we build our cities to put cars first, then most people won't do it. Right. There does seem to be an inherent challenge, I mean, common to kind of all three of these issues, right? And that is it, the, the cause and effect isn't always obvious to people. I mean, like, if, if you take vaccines as an example, the best case scenario 
for getting your vaccine. Is that nothing happened? Is that nothing you? happened? Right. So, and the right. behavioral economists call that loss aversion. So, you know, it's always harder to, to imagine losing something that you've already got mm. as opposed to, um, I mean, we hear this uh, every year around flu season. Like right now, people will say, well, why would I get the flu shot? I didn't get the flu last year and I didn't have the flu shot. Right. I mean, there's, you know, obviously that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty false logic, but um, helping people to anticipate uh, the possibility of a rare but potentially catastrophic event and protect themselves against that versus just continuing with their day to day. It's, you know, it's really challenging, but we know more, we have more science now than we've ever had before about how to help people uh, nudge people towards those, those socially beneficial decisions. And I think we need to use that science. Robin, uh, one last thing for you. I, just uh, sort of a, your, your final thought. As you hear three very different issues, I mean, the way that they play out, the way people react to them, but, but maybe what we can learn about how to move the needle, so to speak, how to get more people on side. Well, I think it's uh, doing a better job educating about risks. We've uh, heard that in some of the other conversation, uh, making sure that the risks are real in a tangible way, um, and also underscoring that just because nothing has happened, if you've driven and not had a collision, that doesn't mean that texting and driving is safe. It simply means that you've been fortunate enough to not have a collision and getting people to realize the one thing crash-involved drivers all have in common is they spend a lifetime wishing they could take it back. That's a good thought to end on. Uh, to all of you, Danielle, Diane, Robin, uh, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, still ahead. Why this American rapper is facing major backlash after comments he made about his daughter's virginity. When rapper T.I. talked on a podcast about his 18-year-old daughter's visit to the doctor, he unleashed an international talking to about values, virginity, myths, and misogyny. Katie Nicholson explains. Before this week, T.I. was known for his music career. That was before he uttered these words about his 18-year-old daughter on this podcast. We have yearly trips to the gynecologist to check her height. Oh, you, hey, <laughs> I'm done with you right now. So, you know, uh, do you go with her? She's a prisoner. Yes, I, yes, I go with her. <laughs> but it's no laughing matter. I was like, what? No, 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 no. It also struck a nerve at Toronto's Women's Hospital. So the virginity examination in itself is unvalid and in fact by the World Health Organization um, was eliminated or um, is not condoned. Gynecologist Yolanda Kirkham says she's only ever had someone ask to inspect their daughter's hymen once. In Canada, a parent cannot demand this information. It would have to come with consent from the patient. But first of all, these types of examinations would not be done. Supporting a daughter's visit to the doctor can be a part of sex-positive parenting. But this expert says not in this case. You're accompanying your daughter to the gynecologist to ensure this social construct that is imaginary, that is what we call virginity, that is full of shame and stigma and fear. And so that to me would also create an environment where that doesn't tell your daughter that she's safe to come to you about when she does decide to have her sexual debut. And over at Planned Parenthood, where thousands of young women get sexual health services, the organization says youth are absolutely welcome to bring a parent, friend or other person that they trust with them to their appointment if they choose, but the decision is ultimately theirs. Safe to say I paid to wait for you. A decision T.I.'s daughter evidently didn't get to make. But at 18, maybe that's about to change. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. And after the break, a sudden shift in a piece of Canadian history. The story behind the Niagara Scow and the renewed efforts to preserve it. News sites in Canada and the U.S. to Britain and Japan are transfixed by a twisted heap of rusted iron perched at the top of Niagara Falls. And Nick Purton reveals why the Niagara Falls scow has the world's attention. From shore, it's hard to even make out what it is. But that's the Niagara scow. 
Nobody paid all that much attention to it until last week, when for the first time in a hundred years, it moved. It crept closer to the falls. That story went around the world. But what I'm here in Niagara Falls to find out is whether this rusted hunk of metal is really something we should care about. So tell me where I moved. It was up about this way here, about uh, 50 yards. And then uh, the current and wind picked it up, kind of spun it and tipped it over to where it sits now. Kip Finn takes me as close as you can get to the scow. For his whole life, the wreckage has been a reminder of how his great-grandfather risked his life out there 100 years ago. When the scow moved, what did, what did you think about? I didn't believe it at first, so I had to come down here and take a look. And yeah, it was, it was heartbreaking. You say heartbreaking, why heartbreaking? Because it's like the only monument that we can attach William Red Hill Sr. to in the area. There's, there's nothing else down here. August 1918, the scow breaks free from a tugboat and heads toward the falls with two men on board. Miraculously, the boat gets hung up on the rocks above the brink. But now the two men are stuck with no way to get to shore. Ropes are shot to the scow, but they get tangled. Enter Kip's great-grandfather, William Red Hill Sr. He stepped forward, he volunteered and said, I'll go out there. And he did, he went out there, he, you know, he had to climb hand over hand in certain areas to, to untangle the ropes. So he's dangling above the water. The man dangling just above the falls, William Red Hill Sr., he'd just returned from fighting in the First World War. He survived that, and here he was putting his life on the line again. I don't think he was scared at all. I don't think he'd want to be anywhere else than hanging over that river, you know, trying to save those guys, doing whatever he had to do to, to get out there and save those guys. And he did, you know, and he, he was pulled back to the, the rooftop over here behind us and uh, to a round of applause. And uh, stories say that the, the firemen kind of, you know, tossed him up in the air and when he got back over there. So it would have been a really neat thing to see. It's too bad there's nothing on video or anything like that. But uh, yeah, it would have been, it would have been something to see. And for a hundred years, the scout didn't move. When it finally did, it brought the story back. And all week, people have been coming here to look at the scow. People like Patrick Siriani. Sir, how come you're uh, looking out at the hey, scow? Hey, how you doing? I, well, you know, it's a very important part of our history out there. And uh, it moved the other night. And I sure hate to see it go and disappear, you know, because when it disappears, we lose that history. And if it does, I'm going to go down to the whirlpool and pick up a piece, get a souvenir, give it to the History Museum. So at least we'll have something. <laughs> but that's not enough for Kip. He wants a permanent memorial to his great grandfather down here by the river. I won't be happy until he's recognized. I don't want him to be forgotten. He's, he's family, you know. <laughs> I never met him. But uh, that's my, that's my great-grandfather, and I'm proud of him. What would you like to say to him? Thank you. When you see it from the shore, it may not look like much, but I'm with Kip. The story of Red Hill Sr. and what he did out there, that shouldn't be forgotten. Mick Purden, CBC News, Niagara Falls. That is a heck of a story. Okay, up next, this photo was about to win a big cash prize until the fire chief decided to withdraw from the contest. We'll tell you why in our moment. This photo was poised to win $5,000 in a competition where the most likes on Facebook would win. And the Reserve Mines Fire Department in Cape Britain Cape hey, Breton was set to take the prize. No surprise there. But then the fire chief backed out, essentially giving the cash to another fire department. His good deed is our moment. We saw the, the post from Smith's Cove, and it really touched us that they were struggling financially and they had equipment that was, you know, sometimes 15, even 20 years old. I told Abe and Roe to, uh, to withdraw us from the competition. Um, but they left our photo up and put in a an special announcement there announcing our withdrawal. We actually shared the photo on our social media sites 
and their votes went from 2,100 to almost 3,300 today. When we heard the news, we, we were just blown away by, by their generosity with it. Bunker gear is very expensive, and we are looking to outfit two firefighters with the money from this contest. Every department is still taking risks. They're going out there, putting their lives on the line, and the least we can do is put them in uh, proper equipment. I love this story. So uh, the winner was announced tonight, and the Smiths Cove Fire Department did indeed win the prize of $5,000. And here's a fact that underlines just how badly they need that money. Of the 24 firefighters at Smiths Cove, only four of them have gear that has not expired. That's The National for this November 8th. Have a good night.